Well, we're going to open up God's Word now. We're going to turn to Isaiah chapter 13. First of all, we're going to read through from 1 through to 13. And a little bit later on, we're going to read from chapter 19, um, verses 18 to 25. We'll follow on through. So starting at the start of Isaiah chapter 13, a prophecy against Babylon. A prophecy against Babylon that Isaiah's son of Amos saw. Raise a banner on a bare hilltop. Shout to them. Beckon to them to enter the gates of the nobles. I have commanded those I prepared for battle. I have summoned my warriors to carry out my wrath, those who rejoice in my triumph. Listen, a noise on the mountains like that of a great multitude. Listen, an uproar among the kingdoms like nations massing together. The Lord Almighty is mustering an army for war. They come from faraway lands, from the ends of the heavens, the Lord and the weapons of his wrath to destroy the whole country. Well, for the day of the Lord is near. It will come like destruction from the Almighty. Because of this, all hands will go limp. Every heart will melt with fear. Terror will seize them. Pain and anguish will grip them. They will writhe like a woman in labor. They will look aghast at each other, their faces aflame. See, the day of the Lord is coming, a cruel day with wrath and fierce anger to make the land desolate and destroy the sinners within it. The stars of heaven and their constellations will not show their light. The rising sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light. I will punish the world for its evil, the wicked for their sins, I will put an end to the arrogance of the haughty and will humble the pride of the ruthless. I will make people scarcer than pure gold, more rare than the gold of Ophir. Therefore, I will make the heavens tremble and the earth will shake from its place at the wrath of the Lord Almighty in the day of his burning anger. And we move on then to chapter 19, verse 18, and we'll read through to 25. So chapter 19 verse 18 through to 25. In that day, five cities in Egypt will speak the language of Canaan and swear allegiance to the Lord Almighty. One of them will be called the City of the Sun. In that day, there will be an altar to the Lord in the heart of Egypt and a monument to the Lord at its border. It will be a sign and witness to the Lord Almighty in the land of Egypt. When they cry out to the Lord because of their oppressors, he will send them a savior and defender and he will rescue them. So the Lord will make himself known to the Egyptians in that day, and they will acknowledge the Lord. They will worship with sacrifices and grain offerings. They will make vows to the Lord and keep them. The Lord will strike Egypt with a plague. He will strike them and heal them. They will turn to the Lord, and he will respond to their pleas and heal them. In that day, there will be a highway from Egypt to Assyria. The Assyrians will go to Egypt and the Egyptians to Assyria. The Egyptians and the Assyrians will worship together. In that day, Israel will be the third, along with Egypt and Assyria, a blessing on the earth. The Lord Almighty will bless them, saying, Blessed be Egypt, my people, Assyria, my handiwork, and Israel, my inheritance. Great. Do keep your uh, your Bibles open for those who are new or newish. We uh, we tend to work our way through uh, books of the Bible uh, and think about what they uh, how they speak to us today, how God is speaking to us today. And so, uh, from September through to Christmas, uh, we're going through the Book of Isaiah. It's a big book, uh, so some parts we're doing in big portions, and this is our biggest portion this morning. Uh, it's 11 chapters. Uh, so, uh, but, but before we get into the, uh, the passage itself, uh, on the screen uh, behind me, there's a picture taken from, uh, from Turkey. It's a city called Antalya. I think I'm pronouncing that correctly. Uh, with the, the mountains behind the city as well. It's not my photo. It's a photo I found on the internet, but it illustrates something that I want to explain to you. What I want you to focus on in this photo is the location of the city in relation to the mountains that are behind it. Now, to make that easier, look at the picture, and on this next screen, there's the, uh, there's the, the mountains and the city uh, picked out in their different sections. So the red part is the city, 
Um, the, the mountain, the first mountain that's there is in green. That's quite close to the city. And then behind that, the next mountain is purple. And uh, the mountain right at the back is kind of orangey yellow uh, at the back. Now, when it's viewed like this, when you see it like this, it all looks very compressed, doesn't it? So the view from the city, the perspective we have compresses the mountains and they look very close together, don't they? But when viewed from the sky above, they would look very different, which is how they are in in that picture. So the red again is the city, and the green is the the first mountain fairly close to the city, but then the mountains behind that are much more spaced apart. There's a wide valley between the mountains, probably, maybe rivers and other settlements in between. Now, I've actually looked on Google Maps to try and identify uh, some of these mountains. Uh, And the furthest mountain, the yellow one, uh, uh, its distance from the edge of the city is either 25 or 35 miles, depending on which of those mountains you can see on satellite view. Um, So that's like from here to Port Talbot. Now, think about from here to to Port Talbot and how many mountains there are in between here and there, how many valleys there are, how many settlements are in between. There's a lot of distance between us and Port Talbot. And likewise, in this image, there would be a lot of distance between the city and each of those three mountains uh, that are overshadowing the city. So in many ways, this is like both the book of Isaiah and history. So this is what Isaiah's writing is like as a unified vision. As Isaiah is writing, all of history is compressed into this one image so that it looks like there's very little distance between everything that Isaiah is talking about. So Isaiah is seeing things on city level, all compressed into one image, no distance in between. But as the next picture shows, this is how history Uh, is actually uh, panned out, if you like. Um, So Isaiah is referring to several different historical periods uh, with sometimes hundreds, even thousands of years in between. So Isaiah obviously is writing in his time, uh, which is approximately 750 to 680 uh, BC, 8th, 7th century before uh, Jesus. Uh, And then he's also sometimes writing about the conquest of Jerusalem, which happened between the years 601 to 586 BC. He also refers to the the life of Jesus, Uh, and if you want to ask me about those dates, I'll happily explain why they might look weird to you. That's another story for another time. Uh, But that's roughly the the, the life of Jesus, Uh, and Isaiah is often referring to the life of Jesus. But then Isaiah is also referring to the return of Jesus to the time when Jesus will come back to this earth, a time that we're still waiting for, and so we can't give it a date. Uh, A little tip for you, if you're ever trying to predict the return of Jesus, put it far into the future so that no one can burn you at the stake for being a heretic and getting the date wrong. Um, But it's best just to leave it as a question mark, because no one knows. Um, So this is a useful way of, of thinking about the prophecy books, like Isaiah, that all of these mountains that have different reference points, um, as, as the prophet is writing, they're compressed close together in one image. And that's kind of what's going on this morning. So this morning, the, these 11 chapters, there are all of these different reference points going on uh, in these chapters. So we can get the, uh, the picture off the screen and uh, move on. But, but uh, key to understanding this, these chapters in Isaiah, key to this, what makes this section different to all the other parts in Isaiah it is, it is about how there's an international dimension to it. So we need to grasp that there's an international dimension to what's going on in these chapters. And what Isaiah was saying... What God was saying through Isaiah was radical. It would have been very challenging, not so much to God's people, but to these nations that Isaiah is uh, directing his message towards. To these nations in these chapters, um, it would have been radical thinking for the, the way Isaiah is talking about things. So uh, it's radical to them, these nations, um, you know, 2,700 years ago, 
but it, was also, it, it is also radical thinking for us today. So let me explain why it's radical for them, and then we'll think about why it's radical for our society today as well. Back then, the idea was that you had local gods. So each region, each nation had its own particular god or gods, idols. Uh, and, and sometimes uh, it would be a particular plot of land would have this god, and then that particular neighboring land would have that god. Uh, and so you have to deal with the god who is over that particular patch of land. So each nation had its own gods. It would be like Wales had its own god, and England had its own god. Perhaps we do, I don't know. Uh, but, but sometimes you might mix and intermingle the two gods uh, and certainly if you were English but moved to Wales, well, you'd have to start worshipping the Welsh god if you wanted to do well. If you wanted to succeed by living in Wales, you need to worship the Welsh god. And sometimes they are gods for different areas of life as well, for different aspects of life. So the idea that there is one true supreme god who is sovereign over all nations, that idea was completely radical for the other nations around Israel. The idea that any one God is greater than nationality and geography, this was new thinking. What about our Western mindset? Well, it it is somewhat different to this. Because we don't tend to believe in multiple gods. You know, some people would, but for the majority of our society, we don't believe in multiple gods. We've got the idea that there's only one god. Uh, And although we have lots of religions, we accept and tolerate all uh, different kinds of religions in our society, um, the idea that we think with is that we're all just worshipping the same god, really. We've all got slightly different emphases that we understand of who or what God is like, Uh, but all of these different views of different religions, they're all equally valid. That's uh, a large part of how our society thinks. So the idea that there is one true God, uh, and there there is one way that he is to be worshipped, that is revealed in one religious grouping, in one religious text, and that he Uh, this God has the right to assert his authority over the whole world, that idea is radical in our modern Western thinking. But that's who the God of the Bible is revealed to be. That's who the God that Isaiah is speaking on behalf of is. So the mindset of 2,700 years ago, it needed to be challenged to see the authority of this one true God over all nations and places. But the mindset of today likewise needs to be challenged to see the authority of this one true God to be who he is and to be worshipped in the way that he ought to be worshipped. Let's uh, dig into these, uh, these chapters, and I think there are uh, two key messages that, that need to be communicated, that the one true God has to say to those nations uh, and to us today. The first message is that international destruction is coming. Now, so far in Isaiah, much of the focus has been on the judgment for Israel, for God's people, the Israelites, um, that they were going to face. Um, God had been nothing but faithful to his people. He had always done uh, what he needed to as God to his people. But his people had been consistently unfaithful. They had consistently turned away from him, rejected him, worshipped these other gods, and and, and done things that were totally wrong, carried out injustice, uh, and, uh, and so on. So the consequences for their sin was exile. God had always said that if they continued to sin against him, he would remove them from their land, he would destroy their, uh, their, their main city, Jerusalem, he would destroy the temple that marked his presence among his people. And he would use this foreign land, this foreign nation, to sweep in and destroy them and take them away from their precious land. So Isaiah's message to the people was, if you don't turn from your sin and turn back to me, then I, God, will do this. I will 
make you go into exile if you don't repent. But both God and Isaiah know that the people are not going to repent. And so this destruction is going to happen. Israel is going to be judged for its sin by exile. But the nations around them, they're not guiltless. And they are not beyond God's reach. So just as Israel have already been told many times that they are going to be held accountable for their sin, so God is going to also hold all the nations around them accountable for their sins as well. Now as chapter 13 started, you may have noticed that this is a prophecy against Babylon. And the reason the prophecy starts with Babylon is because Babylon is the very nation that God is going to use to sweep into Israel and destroy them. He, he, um, uh, he, he also used Assyria for the northern kingdom, uh, but Isaiah's focus was mainly on the southern kingdom, and Babylon swept in and destroyed the southern kingdom, destroyed Jerusalem, and took the people into exile. So that's why uh, God starts with, uh, with Babylon, because they uh, were his means of taking the people into, in, into exile. Now, although God was working and using them, it wasn't, uh, it, it, it wasn't though he was overriding their choice. The Babylonians chose to sweep in and destroy the nation of Israel, to destroy the southern kingdom. It was their own choosing to do that. And so as God was using that... Uh, so they were uh, using it for their sinful purposes. And so God was able to hold them accountable for their sin. Uh, But not just that sin, it was for their many other sins as well. And what we see that happened in history, uh, and it tells us this in the Bible as well, is that another kingdom called the Medes and the Persians, they overtook Babylonia. They overtook the, the Babylon Empire. Uh, they destroyed the Babylon Empire. So just as Babylon destroyed Israel and were sinful for doing that, so the Medes and the Persians then took over Babylon and destroyed them. So Babylon is held accountable for their sins. You can follow the pattern in history. But it's not just Babylon, it's all of these other nations as well. And as you flick through, you can see the headings that the NIV has, has given them. Uh, and uh, you see all the different nations that are there. And so you have Moab and Philistia, Damascus, Cush. And Cush was Ethiopia or uh, kind of. Uh, Egypt and Tyre as well. All of these nations will be held accountable for their sin. And you can look through parts of the Bible sometimes and see the different things that they did that were wrong. Sometimes against Israel. Uh, and, and you can look through history and see it all as well. So through all this, God is saying that he has the right and authority to hold every single one of these nations to account for their sin. God was not their God as far as they saw it. But because he is God of all the earth, he has the right to assert his authority and to punish each nation with destruction for their sin. It's a bit like in school when you you go to your lessons, but the teacher doesn't turn up. You ever been in that position? You're all sat there as a class, all 30 of you, waiting for for, for Mr. Smith to come in and to teach you IT, uh, and uh, he doesn't turn up. So if your teacher doesn't turn up, what are you going to do as students? You muck around, don't you? Is that just me? No, there's some of you as well. Some of you would have joined in the mucking around. Teacher's not here. Let's have some fun. Let's descend into absolute chaos. And before you know it, there's anarchy in the classroom. However, in comes the head teacher. Though your class teacher is missing in action, the head teacher holds authority over the whole school. Your head teacher has the right to punish the whole class for their misbehavior. And that's what's like, what it's like going on here. Even though the, the nations have their own made-up regional gods that weren't really gods anyway, God is over the whole earth. 
The earth is the Lord and Lord's and everything in it, as Psalm 24 opens. And because the whole earth is the Lord's, he has the right to assert his authority over all people. Because all people have sinned, uh, because we have all turned away from God, uh, the one who made us and provides for us every day of our lives. Because of our sin, God has the right to judge everyone. Every one of us. And he will find every human, being guilt, every human being guilty for their sin. Now remember the, 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 the mountains in the photo. Isaiah was talking about the immediate historical events on one hand, about Babylon overtaking the Medes and the Persians, in, which they did in 539 BC. That was, that was Isaiah's immediate horizon. But the mountain in the distance is still to come. The return of Jesus is still to come. And God judging these nations is a picture of what will happen in the further distant horizon when God will hold all people accountable for their sin through Jesus as judge. So one day when Jesus returns, he will bring out everything we've all ever done. Everything we've said. Everything we thought that no one else has seen. He will uncover every motive with which we've done and said things. Even the, the good things that we've done, that we've done for selfish reasons that no one even knows about it will be exposed for what it truly is. And the very fact that, that most people live without any thought of God at all, without giving him any focus in their daily lives, that is enough to condemn us all. If we haven't got, had God as our priority in our lives, that is enough for us to be judged by God. And I include myself in that. I get paid to think about God. And I don't give him the priority he deserves in my life. So all humans, from all time, in all places, we are all under God's authority. He is the rightful uh, ruler of the universe, whether we recognize it or not. And when Jesus returns, we will come under his judgment we'll be scrutinized for how we have lived our lives. We'll be found guilty for our sinfulness because it is there in our lives. We can't hide it. Now, if that were the only message Isaiah was giving, that would be pretty hopeless, wouldn't it? That would be very bleak. But there is hope. Thank God that there is hope. And that's where our second message comes in, because international peace is available. A bit cliche, isn't it, to talk about world peace? But the Bible talks about it. God, in these chapters through Isaiah, speaks about a peace that is there. Not just peace between nations, but peace between us as people and God. Now, many of these nations were sworn enemies... Uh, Egypt and Assyria, as they're mentioned, uh, they were enemies for a long time. You had uh, Assyria, imagine if I'm Israel, you had Assyria, let me get this the right way around, up here, you have Egypt down here. So they're, they're far apart from each other, but they are sworn enemies with Israel in the middle. And Assyria was the threat to the northern kingdom. Lots of these prophecies were, would have been given before Assyria was defeated, um, perhaps even before Assyria had destroyed the northern kingdom. Um, but Assyria was a major threat at the time of, uh, of, of Isaiah uh, speaking and writing. But Egypt was the old oppressor. Egypt was the one who held God's people in slavery. So you've got the current threat versus the old threat with Israel trapped in the middle. Sworn enemies, remember. And with all of that in mind, flick over to chapter 19. We're going to read what was read earlier, just a small portion of that. So chapter 19, if you've got your Bibles open, don't worry if not. Chapter 19, verse 23. In that day, 
there will be a highway from Egypt to Assyria, sworn enemies. The Assyrians will go to Egypt and the Egyptians to Assyria. And you might think, what's this about? Are they going to start a war? But no. The Assyrians, the Egyptians and Assyrians, will worship together. In that day, Israel in the middle will be the third along with Egypt and Assyria. A blessing on the earth. The Lord Almighty will bless them, saying, Blessed be Egypt, my people. That was something God said of Israel, not Egypt. But here he's saying, blessed be Egypt, my people. Assyria, my handiwork. Again, something God said of Israel, but now he says of Assyria. And Israel, my inheritance. So there you see the the establishing of peace between Israel. These free nations. Now, this horizon was never fulfilled in history. And, and so we can conclude that this is, a hanging, uh, this is a hanging horizon that's waiting the return of Jesus. But the international sense of peace that is between these historic enemies is clear. Enemies Egypt and Assyria will have freedom of movement, freedom to travel, freedom to worship together together. Uh, 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 and, and will be equally blessed alongside Israel by God and called his people. And that is huge. This would have been mind-blowing for, for these nations to have heard of this. These past enemies that were previously excluded from God's people will one day be partners and fellow worshippers at peace with each other and at peace with God. And when you look at the verses that come before this as to why this came about, how did this happen, it's all because God reveals himself to these nations. It's all because God saves these nations. He rescues them. He heals them. He doesn't give them plagues to destroy them anymore. He gives them plagues to heal them. And they are then included among his people. They even know the language of worship. And then in other parts of these chapters, you get, you get hints of the person through whom this is going to be accomplished, Jesus. So in chapter 16 and verse 5, there's, there's this promise. In the midst of all this judgment, there's this promise that one of David's descendants will have a throne established for them. Jesus, one of David's descendants who rules on the throne in heaven forever. Or at the end of chapter 22, there's this chap called Eliakim, and he's given this king-like role, like that of David. And you can't help but see hints of Jesus in that as well. They are only hints, but, but they're there nonetheless. One like David will turn upon the scene. One from his line, as Jesus was descended from David. One who will be a channel of hope. One who will uh, bring about justice uh, for, for, for ethnic Israelites, uh, but not just for the ethnic Israelites. One who will uh, bring all the nations of the world under God, which is what Jesus is doing through his people today. Of course, the horizon on which that one is fulfilled, the, the one who would accomplish this, uh, the, these promises, the one who would be from the line of David, all of that is, is fulfilled in the coming of Jesus into the world. As he accomplished God's plan to provide rescue, to save uh, all people from all nations, he was the one sacrifice to atone for sin. And so he, he has now taken up his position on the throne in heaven, ruling over all of the earth uh, as he's seated on the throne there. And as he occupies that position, he is bringing all nations under his rule uh, as, as the message of Jesus reaches different nationalities. So they come to him and accept him as their king, hear about him and bow in submission to him. So look, from, from the majority of these chapters, it, it, it is about judgment. There's no escaping that. You can't whitewash something like the judgment of God. It's there, it's real, it's going to happen. 
All people from all nations will come under God's authority uh, as uh, he looks at what we have all done and finds us guilty for our sin. That is what we all deserve. Except that God has made peace available. Peace between different nationalities. Peace between ourselves and God. Though we have made him our enemy, he has established peace. He has made it available to us. So if you're not yet a Christian, now is the opportunity to bow the knee to Jesus. To recognize him as king. To accept the forgiveness that he offers. And so escape the judgment that should rightfully fall upon each one of us. And if you are a Christian, this global focus needs to be kept absolutely essential. All nations need to hear this message of Jesus. And so what part are you and I going to play in that? We can be people who pray, can't we? Every week in the email that comes out, there's a little section at the bottom with prayer points for how we can pray for for people who are serving uh, the, the work of the gospel all across the world. When the email comes through, do you go to the bottom? Do you pray through those points? Do you keep them as prayer points for the week? What about prayer meetings? We often have prayer meetings that, that focus internationally. Do you come to prayer meetings? Do you come to pray about the work of God across the world? We've got a, a, a mission focus uh, for our prayer meeting a week on Tuesday. Put that in your diaries. Make sure you're there a week on Tuesday to hear about what God is doing in parts of Eastern Europe. Being people of prayer for the nations is vital. We can also be people who give financial support. You know, if you give to the church, then 10% of all that we have that comes in from our church, it gets sent out to one of the six mission partner organizations we, we give to. So as you give to the church, you are also giving to mission. But maybe you could give above and beyond that. Maybe God has blessed you with enough to, to be able to support perhaps one or two other mission organizations, one or two other people that are serving the Lord across the world. So we pray we give. The final possible way we could serve the cause of God across the world is by going. It may be that you could go on short-term mission. There are plenty of short-term missions that happen in the UK that could give you a taste for sharing the gospel without having to fly across the world. But then there are so many other organizations that that work across the world uh, where you can get a taster for for two weeks, for six weeks, for for a whole year. Uh, You could be involved in mission across the world. But it might just be that God is calling someone here to serving overseas uh, or or, uh, elsewhere in the UK on a longer term basis. And if that's what you feel God is prompting you towards, then have a chat with myself or one of the other elders. We can talk it through. We can explore God's call on your life together. But the bottom line of this is that the nations do need to hear about Jesus. The nations need to come under his rule. The nations need to be part of his people as well. It is only that that will establish true peace between nations. It's also that and only that that will establish peace between us and God. And it's the only means by which we can escape the judgment that we deserve for our sin.